Oh man, there's so many things I love about the Bible, but uh, I think I love the scope. I love that it covers so many subjects. I love that there's so many different voices speaking. Um, I love the amount of time that it covers. I mean, it's just expansive. But I think one of the things I love the most about it is when I'm feeling like things are just crazy, like the world is crazy, things might even be crazy in my home. I feel like when I go to scripture, there's this really clear, simple, loving, truthful um, reality that I can um, just rest in. And I'm just so thankful for that. I'm so thankful for that. That's the way that God put his words together. Um, one of my absolute favorite passages in the Bible is, uh, has been with me like for years and years and years is, is Philippians 4, 4 through 9. And uh, I think it's just easy for me to get overwhelmed by life. And I have this posted above my kitchen sink so that when I'm doing the dishes, I can just pause and think about what's true. Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever's true, whatever's noble, whatever's right, whatever's pure, whatever's lovely, Whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Whatever you've learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put it into practice and the God of peace will be with you. Well, today we're kicking off a four-week series called The Book. It's all about the Bible, which, which the Bible simply means the book. This is, this is the book above all books. This is the book that is breathed by the Spirit of God, that can transform our lives and give us power and hope and guidance and direction. And this book we're going to learn today, this is the book that Jesus loved. Technically, it was a series of scrolls, but the words of this book in the Old Testament, the first two-thirds of the Bible, that was, that was Jesus' Bible, the book that he loved. And it's beautiful. Jesus wasn't just the living word of God. He loved the written word of God. It was a part of who he was. And in this whole year, we're thinking about what it means to be more like Jesus. If you want to be more like Jesus, learn to love the book that Jesus loved. And in Matthew chapters 5, 6, and 7, we find a sermon called the Sermon on the Mount. This is the longest recorded sermon of Jesus in the Bible. And, and as Jesus is, is preaching to this group of people on this mountainside, he says these words. Jesus says, Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. That's the beginning of the Bible. So don't think I've come to abolish it, to get rid of it. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For truly I tell you, until heaven and earth disappear, not the smallest letter, not the least stroke of a pen, will by any means disappear from the law, from God's book, until everything is accomplished. Jesus said, I didn't come to get rid of the book. I didn't come to undercut the book. I came to fulfill it. I came to, to live it out, to show what it looked like, to follow God's will and God's ways. And I came to lift it up. And through Jesus' coming, he began to give the story of the Gospels for the fulfillment of the finishing of this book that we have in our hands today. And, and so as we begin, understand that, that for Jesus, this was Jesus' favorite book. Now, I'll be honest, as a Christian, I hope, and as a pastor, I hope for every single Christian, if you have to pick one favorite book, I hope it's the Bible. But I actually have lots of other books that are maybe in that next tier of favorite. And I grabbed a few of them off my shelves. I don't know what you're, if you're a reader what your favorite book is. Here's one of my favorite books. It's called The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. C.S. Lewis wrote this for children. That's probably why I like it. I'm kind of a kid at heart. But, but there's, there's seven books in this series, The Chronicles of Narnia, and this is the kickoff book, and it's powerful. I love anything that Malcolm Gladwell writes. This is a book called Outliers that is just profound. He makes you think, 
ponder. Uh, this is a book called Good to Great. Uh, in terms of leadership books, by many people, they'd say this is their favorite, strongest leadership book. Uh, Nabil Qureshi, many of you uh, knew Nabil. He's with Jesus now. A devout Muslim who became a follower of Jesus. This is his story of seeking Allah and finding Jesus. And he preached here at our church, and we're going to have a night of worship coming up where we're going to hear about some of his life. And, uh, and then also, this is a, b- a book I grabbed called Out of the Salt Shaker, Into the World. It's the first book I read on evangelism. I've probably read 50 books on evangelism since then about sharing our faith naturally. And I've ended up writing books about this topic because it's so much a part of who I am. But this is, it was a book that just kind of kicked me off. And, and there's other books. Uh, the book I give away the most, The Case for Christ by Lee Strobel. It goes on. I could just, I could tell you about so many of these books. But, but with all the books that are out there, and I, I encourage people to read. I taught my boys growing up that the best way to get forward in any aspect of life is to be a great reader and a great thinker. And you can learn almost anything if you learn to read. And so I hope for you, you have many favorite books, but I hope that above all the books, you would say that this book, the book, God's book, is, is your favorite in that it has the greatest impact in your life and that you read it most often and that you read it again and again and again and then you let the Holy Spirit speak to your heart and your life and transform you. And so we're going to talk about the book that Jesus loved. And I'm going to share four thoughts about, about this book and, and about Jesus. And so here's the first thing. And if you're a note taker, there's a place on your Shoreline app to write a few thoughts down. But here's the first thing. The book Jesus loved, it gives wisdom for daily life. If you want wisdom for your daily life, read this book. I, I, you say, wisdom for what part of my life? Every part of your life. Romance, it's in here. Business, it's in here. Personal finances, it's in here. Times of pain and sorrow and struggle, it's in here. How do I deal with my anger? It's in here. This book may not answer every specific question you have, but it will touch on every theme or topic of human existence. God's book speaks and gives wisdom for our daily lives. And and you think about it, if this is God's word, and as Christians we absolutely are confident that it is, if if these words are breathed by the Spirit of God, you better believe that all the wisdom you need, all the wisdom of heaven that we can handle and understand is captured in the pages of this book. And so we shouldn't be surprised by that. And as Jesus was was teaching and preaching when he walked on this earth, he would often say this. He would say, you have heard that it was said. You know, you have heard that it was said. Every time you hear Jesus in the Bible say, you have heard that it was said, here's what he's talking about. Back here in the first two-thirds of the Bible. When he says, you have heard that it was said, he's saying, it's written in the Scriptures. It's written in God's Word. And then he would quote that. And then he would expound on it and make sense of it and talk about this is what it looks like to live a wise life. And it is hard to live a wise life in our world. But this book can guide you down that path. So if you have your Bibles, I'd invite you to turn with me to Matthew chapter 5. You can turn in your Bibles there. You can go on your Bible app there, and it'll also be on the screen. But in Matthew 5, this is, again, in the Sermon on the Mount, the longest sermon of Jesus ever recorded. And in the beginning in verse 21, we read these words. And here's how Jesus begins. You have heard that it was said. So you go, okay, this is going to be a quote from the Old Testament. You have heard that it was said to the people long ago, you shall not murder. That's quoting from Exodus 20, the Ten Commandments. You shall not murder. And anyone who murders will be subject to judgment. But I tell you that anyone who is angry with a brother or sister will be subject to judgment. Again, anyone who says to a brother or sister, raka, which means empty-headed one. Think about that, right? It's answerable to the court. And anyone who says, you fool, will be in danger of the fire of hell. Boy, Jesus is taking it up, man. He's saying, you know, don't murder, but man, watch what you say and watch what you think about people and watch your anger quotient as it's welling up. And then he says this, Therefore, if you are offering your gift at the altar, and there you remember that your brother or sister has something against you, not you against them, but they have something against you, leave your gift there in front of the altar. First, go and be reconciled to them. Then come and offer your gift. You want to talk about profound wisdom, wisdom that's hard for us to comprehend. Man, when we get angry, we want to we wanna do something, man. We, when we get angry, we want to let people have it. And, G- and Jesus says, watch your anger level. Watch your words. 
Watch the tone and the condition of your heart. And even watch your behavior. If you're coming to God to worship and to offer your sacrifices, a sacrifice of praise, a sacrifice of offerings, and in that moment of worship you realize, I am a broken relationship. I have a broken relationship with this person. He says, you're better to just leave your gift right there and go get that thing healed. Now I need to let you know, this was the passage that I chose for this part of this sermon weeks before where we are right now. This is weeks before... um, the, the, the level of tension we have in our country right now, weeks before the news cycle of all that's happening, all of the violence, all the conflict in our world. But this, this text speaks to our lives. It speaks to the issue of anger. Now, the Bible is clear that there are times where there's righteous anger. But man, the Bible warns when anger is welling up inside of you, be careful. Because anger and bitterness, whatever's driving it, and, and, and in many ways, if, if it explodes into violence, it, the, the, the enemy, Satan, is, is, is fueling that fire of anger. But anger can lead us to evil. Sometimes anger can lead us to righteousness, if it's righteous anger. But anger that's uncontrolled can lead us to evil. To the kind of evil where, where one human being in a, power, a position of power and authority can put their knee on the neck of another human being and keep it there till that person dies. That is raw, pure, demonic evil from the pit of hell. And it breaks the heart of God and it should break our hearts. And so often evil leads to evil when it goes unchecked. And evil leads to evil. So, so then you have people who then begin to rob and begin to loot and begin to steal and destroy the businesses of people who've worked a lifetime to build their business and burn it to the ground in one moment of anger. And that is evil, pure evil from the pit of hell. And Satan loves it. And we as followers of Jesus, our hearts should be broken and we should hate that kind of evil. But that then can then escalate if it's left unchecked. And all of a sudden now it's people who are targeting Police officers and people in roles of authority who are trying to protect their community in a whole different community, in a whole different state, in a whole different situation. People had nothing to do with anything that happened over here and it bursts out with anger and bitterness and then there is shooting and running down of people who have nothing to do with the other evil. But evil begets evil begets evil. And it breaks the heart of God and it should break our hearts. And if left unchecked, it just, it just continues to spiral and the fire gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And so when Jesus speaks to us and, and when, he, when he calls us to check our hearts, when we say, Je- Jesus, love this book because this book gives wisdom for every part of life. Think about what's happening in our world right now. Think about what's happening all around our world and all around our country and listen to these words again and see if you hear the wisdom of the living God, the Holy Spirit breathed wisdom of God. You have heard that it was said to the people long ago, you shall not murder. Anyone who murders will be subject to judgment. We all say, well, amen to that. But I tell you that anyone who's angry with a brother or sister will be subject to judgment. Again, anyone who says to a brother or sister, Raka, you empty-headed one, is answerable to the court. And anyone who says, you fool, will be in the danger of the fire of hell. That's the words of Jesus. And then he says this, therefore, and he's talking to each person in that crowd, and he's talking to us. This is the wisdom of Scripture that speaks to our hearts. Therefore, if you are offering your gift at the altar whether it's songs of praise, whether it's, whether it's offerings, whether it's your worship of Jesus, if you're offering your gift to the altar and there you remember that your brother or sister has something against you, leave your gift in front of the altar. First go and be reconciled to them and then come offer your gift. This is the wisdom of God. Get reconciled. Make things right. Not just with people you have an issue with, but with people who have an issue with you. It's so important to Jesus that he says you stop in the middle of your act of worship and you make it right. And maybe for some people listening right now, the best thing you can do right now is to stop watching this sermon and pick up the phone and call someone who you have an issue with and be reconciled. That application of God's word would be far more powerful than listening to another word I say. And certainly if someone's in your mind before this day is done, 
connect with them, talk with them. And you look at our world where how much bitterness, how much conflict from, from all kinds of people groups and all kinds of individuals, the conflict, and, and, and Jesus says, seek reconciliation. First, go and be reconciled to them. Then come offer your gift. You know, anger can lead to anger and to evil and to greater and greater evil. So here's the question. Do you need wisdom and direction as you navigate the complexities, the complex realities of daily life? Then read the book that Jesus loved. If you look and say, man, I don't know how to deal with this situation. Our economic situation right now is so confusing. The, the, the political tensions that we have in our world are so, so intense. Go to the book. Conflict between people groups all around the world, all around our communities. Go to the book. It's more than just reading this book. We take what God speaks to us from this book and then we live it out. We live in a different way, in a new way, in a way that's baffling to some because they can't imagine you living the way the Bible calls you to live, but you follow this book and it will lead to what God wants for you and God wants for me. And so I challenge you to open this book and to follow what it says and to grapple with what it says. And if what it calls you to stretches you and makes, it makes it, you go, this is hard to do, that's probably good. We should, we, if everything in the Bible was easy to do, man, then, then I don't think it would be the word from God because God's calling us to be more than we can be in our own power. This is the book that Jesus loved. And so here's the second insight. The book Jesus loved, number two, is the foundation and the source of meaning. If you want to know the foundation and the source of meaning for your life, for who you are, for what you do, it's found in this book. Pe people go on this quest to discover themselves. And I want to say, don't go on a quest and travel around the world to discover yourself. Look to this book. I was on a plane flying. Uh, it was an international flight, and there was this couple. Uh, I was sitting here. The woman was in the middle seat, and her husband was next to her. And I, and I said, oh, where are you coming from? And she said, she, I, think, I think it was a 12-month open ticket where she and her newlywed husband had traveled the world. I don't know who, has the, who could afford to do that, but they could. And they had traveled the world, and, and I said, well, just traveling? And she says, well, it was kind of like a year-long honeymoon, and I was really just trying to discover the meaning of life and why I'm on this planet. And I said, well, I said, did you find it? And very soberly, very sadly, she said, no. And I thought, you traveled the whole world. And she told me some of the places she went, and she swam in these pools, and she skydived here, and all these different things. She said, no. And I actually said to her, I said, can I tell you where I found the meaning of life? She's like, yeah. And I talked about Jesus, the one who loved this book and who's revealed in this book. Look to this book if you want to figure out who you are. Parents and grandparents, as your kids are trying to figure out who they are, as your grandkids are trying to figure out who they are, guide them to this book. But it's all an old book. Yes, it is. It has the wisdom of the ages and the heart of God. But open this book and know it and teach it to the next generation. So the foundation, the source of our meaning is found in God's book. Even Jesus drew his definition of who he was and a sense of who he was from the scriptures. That's because Jesus Christ was prophesied in the Old Testament scriptures, fulfilled in the New Testament. But, but Jesus, who was the Messiah, understood that the Old Testament scriptures said he would come as the Messiah, as the Savior, that he would be the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. So he took that position, even that he would be the shepherd, the good shepherd over God's people. Jesus identified himself based on what the scriptures said about him. Now, he was God, so he knew who he was, but there's a sense that he understood that the book pointed to who he was, and it also points to who we are. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to John chapter 10. And in this passage, we get this beautiful kind of pastoral picture of who Jesus is, but also who we are. Because when we know who Jesus is, if he's Savior, we're the ones being saved. If he's the good shepherd, we find out that we're the sheep. And that's what we learn in John chapter 10, beginning in verse 11. Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. The hired hand is not the shepherd and does not own the sheep. So when he sees the wolf coming, boom, he runs for the hills. He abandons the sheep and he runs away. Then the wolf attacks and the flock is scattered. The man runs away because he is a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. You can hear the heart of Jesus saying, saying this hired hand doesn't care. He runs away, but then he says, but I am the good shepherd and I know my sheep. That's you. That's me if we put our faith in Jesus. 
I am the good shepherd, and I know my sheep, and my sheep know me. Just as the Father knows me, and I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. Do you want to know who you are? Do you want to know who Jesus is? You go to this book. Jesus loved this book because in this book, we can discover who we are in a world that says to you, you are worthless and you're nothing. And God says, you're a child of mine and of infinite value. In a world that says you have nothing to offer, God says, I will gift you and call you to do things you could never do on your own. This book reveals who we are. So here's the question. Do you want to know your purpose and mission in life? If you do, then read the book that Jesus loved. If you want to know your purpose, you want to know your mission, why you're on this planet, it's here in these pages. You will discover it. You read this book and you will learn that you are loved. You are loved that Jesus offered forgiveness by giving his life on the cross. You are so loved, Jesus laid his life down. This book tells you that. If you want to know who you are, read this book and you'll learn that you have value. You are valued as a precious child of the living God. As a dad with three sons, I will tell you, there's, there's almost nothing in this world that I value that really matters to the core of who I am, but my sons matter. And God says, you're my daughter, you're my son, you're my beloved. You find out who you are when you know what this book says. When you don't just read it, but when you let this book speak truth to your heart. You find in this book that you have meaning that you have a purpose and meaning. There's things that God has planned for you. You read this book and you find out in, in, in 1 Corinthians, in Romans, in Ephesians, in 1 Peter, you find out that the God of heaven has gifted you with specific abilities and gifts so you can serve him in this world. And you have a reason and a purpose and a mission. And this book will clarify that for you. And that's, that's power. You, 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 you'll find, and here's one other thing you'll find out in this book. You'll find out that you are unique and distinct. That every single human being is unique and distinct. Years ago, uh, there's, there's a company uh, with a strange name called Despair.com, and they make posters. You know, they're really, they, if you go to offices, sometimes there's these really happy posters with really inspirational sayings. Well, they make really happy posters with discouraging sayings or funny sayings. And I've actually got one of them that my youngest son, Nate, gave me this in my office uh, right now. And I look at it every so often, I always laugh. But there's one of these posters that has snowflakes all over it. And it, and it says something like this. It says, you are like a snowflake, completely unique, just like everyone else. And there's beauty. You, you, you are distinct and unique and loved by God, just like everyone else. So when, so when I look at how God looks at me, he sees me as beautiful and wonderful and distinct. But when God looks at the person sitting next to me, they're just as loved by God. They're just as wonderful in his sight. So this book shows us who Jesus is. It shows us who I am, who you are, but it shows us who the people around us are and gives us God's perspective. Jesus loved this book, and I pray you grow to love it too. The book Jesus loved is the Bible. And here's another reason Jesus loved it. This book gives us power to win spiritual battles. If you want the strength to stand strong, and in the battles that come against you spiritually, this is your primary weapon. In, in, in Matthew chapter 4 and in Luke chapter 4, you, you have two accounts of Jesus being tempted by the enemy. Matthew 4, Luke 4. I'm going to read part of Matthew chapter 4. And what, what you need to notice is that in all three of the temptations, in each kind of round of temptations, in each case, Jesus responded by saying, it is is written, and he quoted from the book of Deuteronomy from the Old Testament. When the enemy came and enticed, Jesus responded, and he counter, counteracted, and he fought back with the words, it is written, it is written, it is written. Listen to Matthew chapter 4, beginning in verse 1. Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And after fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. The tempter came to him and said, if you are the Son of God, tell these stones to become bread. And Jesus answered, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. And each time the enemy entices and tempts, Jesus says, It is written, it is written, it is written. And for you and I, we can learn from this. Here's the question. Do you want wisdom, power, and fortification 
when the enemy attacks and entices. And I know the answer to that. Man, you want wisdom. You want power. You want strength and fortification. Anytime the enemy attacks, you want to stand strong. Then read the book that Jesus loved. If you want to stand strong against temptation and sin, get into this book. And let this book get into you, into your mind. I would challenge you to memorize passages from the Bible that you think are powerful or meaningful. A verse, a little chunk of verses, two or three, two or three verses together, maybe a chapter of the Bible, so that when that enticement comes, when that temptation comes, you can just run through that scripture in your mind and run through it in your heart. There is something about having God's word at your fingertips. And you go, well, I can just pull it up on my phone anytime I want to. Well, yes, you can, and you should. But there's something about having it deep in your mind and deep in your soul so that it just comes out of you so that you know how to respond when the temptations come. And and if you long for that, if you long for that strength, look to the book that Jesus loves. And understand that whatever you're facing, uh, there, there is fortification. Whatever the enticement, whatever the temptation, whatever the demonic attack, whatever work of Satan that's happening in the world, there, there's answers in this book. And I really believe that if we, go to the, if we do this, if we go to this book and see what it says, and then we live it out, we can change the world. That's what God wants. He wants us to go to his word, to know the truth of it. We, power, we, we, we stand in the power of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, but then we take action. And I was thinking about this through, you know, we, we've sort of had as a, as a culture, as a world, like, like this, this boxing match. And, and things have come at us like punch, punch, punch. So you have COVID-19 and all the sickness and all the fear and all the, all the anxiety. And then with that, then there's sheltering in place and, and the isolation and the fear of that. And, and, and then within that economic struggles, because the economy struggles, as you go, that's put on top. It's just like, boom, punch, punch, punch. Political unrest and tension that people are trying to leverage this moment to, to kind of jockey for political position and power. And then just kind of human evil as people are finally coming out of their homes. There's, there, there's acts of violence and, and, and then conflict conflict between peoples. And you go, in all of this, you go, what do I do? I mean, what do I do when all these things are coming my way? And and here's here's what I would challenge you to do. You open this book, you keep your eyes on Jesus, and you take action. You hear God's truth, you look at Jesus Christ, the truth, the way, the truth, and the life. And then as he speaks to you through his word, you take action. So as, as you go through, and, and COVID-19 is not over yet. This is still part of our world. And, and so you say, well, as that's going on, how am I praying for medical professionals? How am I praying for those who are sick? Am I praying for a vaccine? Am I sending a note or making a call to a friend of mine who's a nurse, and she's given hour after hour, and she's weary and tired? Am I encouraging her and blessing her and building her up? This word calls us to love and care for those who are serving faithfully. So let it move you to action economic struggles. You read this book and you go, the economy is struggling. And you understand that God is the sovereign and on the throne and he's over all things. And so you pray for God's provision and you pray for our economy to stabilize and for the world economy to stabilize. But then you pack up a bag or two of groceries and you bring them to the food pantry here at Shoreline. Because this week, we've had more activity and more need in our food pantry than any time in the history of Shoreline Church. So when anxiety comes and worry worry comes, you read the book and you fix your eyes on Jesus and you let his truth speak to your heart and then you do something. You act on what he speaks to you. Where there's political unrest, you read God's book and you see what he has to say about how we relate to people even when we disagree with them. You keep your eyes on Jesus. And then when you're talking with somebody with a different perspective, you don't come with bitterness and anger and hatred and violence. You don't. Not if you're a Christian, you don't. You can disagree I shared this in a letter recently to the congregation. You can agree to disagree without being disagreeable. You can extend grace like Jesus did. When there's human evil around us, where there's conflict, and right now we're seeing, we're seeing just, just battles and conflict and bitterness and anger and hatred and senseless violence. And it's so, it's so easy just to kind of to want to kind of turn into a ball and ignore it or to kind of, kind of pull back and just say, I have nothing to do with that. I'm going to you know, lock my doors and ignore it. But I, I would tell you the same thing in the midst of all of that. You open this book and you read it and you fix your eyes on Jesus and not, not so much time on social media and on news, but in this book and eyes on Jesus and enough of the news to know what's going on so you can pray well, but don't let it consume you. And then you do what you can. You do something 
You don't just talk about it. You don't just post about it. You, you, you don't just tweet about it. You do something. What can you do? Do something. This last week, I had something interesting happen. While all this is going on, um, I spoke to a group of pastors a few weeks ago. A group called me and said, can you do a talk for pastors in Michigan? Well, I'm not going to fly there, but they said, just do it all online. And I travel places and speak, and they normally pay me something to do that. And if it's for organic outreach, I give it to the church. And if it's on my own time, it's for me. But, but this was on my own time, so I spoke to these pastors, and I thought that was it. Well, I got a gift in the mail this week. And God put on my heart, that gift's not for you. That gift is for what's happening in our world right now. And so I just went on GoFundMe, and I went to Minneapolis Needs, and there were like 16 different GoFundMes, and this one jumped out at me. They need a certain amount of money. They're not in anywhere close towards it. And it was one street in Minneapolis where basically all the small bur- businesses were burned to the ground. And they're trying to rebuild. And I put on, my, put on my heart, half the money goes to that. And the other half goes to kind of the, the person who where all this began in a memorial fund for, for a man whose life was taken senselessly. And so I gave half to the, the George Floyd Memorial Fund and half to this one street that needs it. Now, that's not a big thing. And when I looked at the amount going, it, was, it wasn't like it was all paid for now, but it was something. And, and I, want, I want to say to our congregation right now, if everyone who calls Troy in their church home, whatever the, the, the struggle and the conflict is, if you will stay in this book and keep your eyes on Jesus and do what God calls you to do, that has power to make a difference. And if you're finding rage building up inside of you, but you're not doing anything about it, that rage at some point is going to explode. And maybe on the wrong people, maybe on your dog, maybe on your kid, maybe on your spouse, maybe on your neighbor, maybe on a business owner somewhere. I'd never do that, but man, things are blowing up. Come to Jesus, go to his word, and do something. And watch what God does through you. And then finally, the book Jesus Loved is a source of strength in our times of pain. Man, in times of hurt, in times of pain, we have to come to this book. Man, we've been walking through the Psalms in our, in our weekly devotions, but if you open this book in times of pain, and there are passages that will speak to your heart. And Jesus Christ, our Savior, our Lord, when he was hanging on the cross, the ultimate pain, the, the ultimate injustice, the ultimate physical suffering, the ultimate spiritual suffering, all the sins of humanity and all their punishment and all their judgment is placed on Jesus Christ on the cross. And in that moment, he quotes scripture. He quotes from Psalm 22. And our Savior, while dying and suffering on the cross for our sins, he cries out from Psalm 22, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me, so far from my cries of anguish? My God, I cry out by day, but you do not answer. By night, but I find no rest. And so he's quoting this psalm because it it captures his heart, but then he finds comfort in the psalm because the psalm goes on to say, yet you are enthroned as the Holy One. You are the one Israel praises. In you, our ancestors put their trust. They trusted and you delivered them. To you, they cried out and were saved. In you they trusted and were not put to shame. And the comfort and the strength of the word of God. If we're becoming more like Jesus, then in our times of pain, let's turn to his word. Let's open the book and read it and let the Holy Spirit minister to our hearts. Here's the final question. Do you want comfort and hope in the most painful and difficult times of life? then read the book that Jesus loved. If you are hurting right now through family issues, through personal issues, through global issues, through through national issues, if your heart is grieving and hurting, don't close the book and walk away and stay away from God. Open God's book and let him speak to you. And let him bring the comfort of his Holy Spirit. One of the names for the Holy Spirit is the paraclete, the comforter, the one who comes and comforts us at the core of who we are. Look to the word of God and let the spirit of God breathe truth into your heart and truth into your life. And so I want to invite you, if you don't have a Bible, and some of you listening may not have a Bible, or maybe you don't have a modern English Bible, maybe, maybe someone in the family gave you a Bible that has lots of these and thous and it's hard to read, and you don't know where you put it, but if you really don't have a Bible that's in modern English, will you just text the word Bible to the number you see on the screen, and we will send you a Bible. Just let us know you need one, and we would love to give you that gift. And then... Every week of these four weeks, 
I'm going to be sharing on the Shoreline app three ideas for how to read the Bible, fresh new ways to engage with the Word of God. So when you get your Bible, and for all of you that have a Bible, find it, take it out, dust it off, and start reading it. If you listen to the Bible on your phone, great. If you read the Bible in, with a paper Bible, fine. But let the words of God come into your heart and your mind and bring transformation in your life. I want to pray with you and ask that God's word in a whole new way would become your favorite book, that the book would become the book in your life. God, that's our prayer. We get so busy and distracted doing other things, looking at other things, focusing on other things, and sometimes we miss this gift that we have. Lord, we can, we can jump from show to show to show and stream, 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 stream till we're exhausted and we feel more tired and more empty when we're done. And we can open, this, open up this book for 15 minutes and feel you breathe life into us. God, I pray over these four weeks we will grow to love your word and know your word and read your word and follow your word. Let this book become the book that guides our lives every moment of every day. We pray this for the glory of Jesus and in his name. Amen. Well, before I give you a word of blessing and you move on with the rest of your day, I want to just share three quick things with you. Number one, again, there's a number on the screen. Just text the word Bible. If, you don't, if you've got 20 Bibles, don't text the word Bible to that number. But if you don't have a Bible or a modern English Bible, let us know and we will get one to you as quickly as we can. Number two, we have a lot of people in Shoreline who transition. They come for schooling and they come with the military and after a season they move on and go somewhere else. If you, in the next three to four months, are going to be transitioning, we know a lot of our military are getting ready to transition. We want to connect with you right now after the service. We're going to, we, we have sending times here on our campus, but we can't do that now. We want to do an online sending time with you where my wife and I and Patty, who's our connections leader, just want to bless you and talk with you and share with you. And, and, and I think Pastor Roy is going to join us also. And so we want to meet with you either at 940, 1110, or 1240, depending on which service you're in. If, you'll, if you will uh, go on the website, there's a link there, and join us kind of in a virtual conversation. We want to pray for you, bless you, and send you off with the blessings of Jesus Christ. Please give us the honor of doing that with you. And in, in just a few minutes, jump on, and we'll be there waiting for you. And then finally, and you'll get a lot more details coming, uh, and I shared this in a letter I sent out to everyone yesterday, and I'll share it with you now. Again, if you didn't read the letter yesterday, uh, we are going to have a regathering service. We're not calling it reopening because Shoreline never closed. The Church of Jesus never closes. We're going to have a regathering service, actually two of them, on, on Sunday, June 14th at 9.30 and 11.30, outdoors, in our courtyard and overflowing to the upper parking lot and out beyond the courtyard. And we're going to follow all the social distancing protocols and we're going to have a great time worshiping God. If you are interested in being part of that service, you go online and you can register. You have to register because we're going to reserve a space for you with social distancing. If you say, we're coming into this service with four people, we will literally reserve you a spot and send you where your seat's going to be. And when you show up, we'll get you right there. Now, we say a seat. What you're going to have is a carpet square that's two feet by two feet. No chairs. You bring your own chair or bring your own stool or bring your own blanket. But you have your two by two foot square, so, and you're going to also bring a sweater and a wide brim hat and sunscreen because it's Monterey. It could be cool, it could be hot, or it could be both back and forth through the whole service. So prepare to layer. You know where you live and bring those things with you. Uh, we ask you to wear a face covering in your arrival, in your departure. Once you're in your place, you can keep it on or take it off. But if you're going to sing with any sense of robust a flim, flecking, singing. We're going to ask you to put your mask back on. And so we're, but we're going to have a great time. Our worship team is excited to lead you in worship. I'm excited to bring God's word and walk into week two of the book. Uh, also, I uh, want to let you know there'll be no hospitality served, at least for the first few weeks. So bring your own hospitality. Treat yourself well. Buy yourself a donut. Bring some fresh fruit. You got to prepare it yourself and you will appreciate our hospitality team more than ever when we're back here again. I and mean, we can say, thank you for preparing this for me. Bring your own hospitality. And there's, there's lots more detail. The key thing is this. We believe that all the spots are going to fill up. We have limited space. So right away, go on the website, fill out the information. We'll respond back and say, you have a seat for one, a seat for three, a seat for ten. And we'll let you know where it's going to be. So when you come, you can say, I'm in section one, row four, and we'll get you right there. It's, it's going to be 
a blast. It's going to be a lot of fun. Again, and let me be very, very clear. If you look and say, right now, I'm not ready yet to come on the campus and to gather. I just, I'm, not, I'm not there yet. We will have at 8.30, 10, and 11.30 online services that will be amazing, excellent, the same quality of music, the same preaching. I'll be, I'll be preaching and recording my sermon for you online, and I'll be preaching live for the people that are here. So we are going to meet the needs of everyone in our church. If you want to be online, three services, be part of that. If you want to be present on campus, register, save a space, and be part of that. My last thought. We're going to agree to disagree without being disagreeable as a congregation. If you're not ready to meet on campus yet, don't come down on people who are ready. It's legal. We're following all the protocols. If you feel good coming on campus, don't taunt the people who are staying home. Bless them. We, we're offering something for everybody. That's one of the, the things that Shoreline does. And so we invite you to come and join us on campus or online. And this next Sunday, a week from today, let's worship together in the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit. And between now and then, open the book. There's a weekly reading, there's a daily reading guide on, on your app and on the website and three new ways to read the Bible on your app. Dig into God's word and we'll gather again next week. Now let me just have the honor of sending you off with a word of blessing. As you go into the rest of your day, May you grow to love the book that Jesus loved and loves. May you engage with the Holy Spirit-breathed Word of God. May God give you comfort through His Word. May God give you direction through His Word. May God help you see who you are as you read His Word and who the people around you are, their value, their beauty, and who God has made them. And then gather with us again next week online or on campus. And let's just continue to grow in the word of God. God bless you. Have a great week. And we will see you next Sunday.